Welcome to episode 175 of 10 Minute Record Reviews, and this time I'm going to talk about an album by Milton Nascimento and Lo Borges from Brazil, quite well known in Brazil, not that well known outside that country, called Clube da Esquina, and apologies for all my Portuguese pronunciation through the rest of this review. This is uh, a 19, well, late 1970s reissue of an album which originally came out in 1972, it's a gatefold, very kind of exile and Main Street kind of uh, interior. And a lot of people have assumed for many, many years that the two kids in the cover are actually Milton and Lowe when they were younger. Not the case at all. On the 40th anniversary of the record, there was a campaign that went on to find out who these kids actually were. They actually identified them. There was a photo taken, which I'll show you here, which shows them recreating the shot. And then, of course, they promptly sued. Although, I don't know what actually came to the court case. Without a word of hyperbole, it's an achingly sad, brilliantly beautiful, monumental record, which is really born of the pain of a dictatorship which Brazilians at that point have been living with since 1964. Milton Nascimento is one of the most remarkable musicians of the 20th century. He's a wonderful songwriter, but he also has this incredible and unique voice, a haunting sound and an incredible range. He was born in 1942 in Rio. His mother sadly dies when he's 18 months old, and he moves with his adopted family to the state of Minas Gerais. And then when he's 21 years old, he moves to the capital of Minas Gerais, Belo Horizonte. There he quickly becomes friends with two brothers who lived in the same building as him, Marcio and Lo Borges. They would jam, they would gate together, they began writing music together, and in that process they began to fuse traditional Brazilian musical forms and rhythms with more contemporary Western pop sounds like those of the Beatles. Milton was the first to make a name for himself, and he starts to release records by 1967, that year he releases two albums, both self-titled on two different labels. He comes to the attention of the American producer Creed Taylor. Milton makes a record with Taylor on a and which was a label that Taylor was working for then, called Courage. It's very well received, and so in some respects, he's kind of on his way. He's got his foothold into the American market. But fame in a kind of Western pop setting was not really what was animating Milton, particularly given the political and social context back home in Brazil. In the 1950s and 1960s, and particularly since the Cuban Revolution, the American government was extraordinarily anxious about the emergence of potentially leftist regimes elsewhere in Latin America and began to support actively the efforts of particularly militaries in Latin America to subvert or overthrow left-leaning governments, even if they were democratically elected. And of course, in 1964, what happens in Brazil is there's a coup and the generals take over. This is the first of a whole series of coups and repressive actions supported by the Americans, which leads to the Pinochet regime in Chile, obviously the generals in Brazil, the Argentinian junta, thousands upon thousands of disappearances, murders, torture, you name it, 20 years of this. In 1964, this all happens just as Brazil's earlier musical innovation, the fabulous sound of bossa nova, is breaking as a worldwide phenomenon. But bossa nova was widely seen as a kind of politically neutral, somewhat vacuous kind of good time party cocktail music with a military dictatorship for a lot of people, particularly younger people, this wasn't acceptable. So in the middle and later 1960s, music other than bossa nova becomes essentially a vehicle in many ways for opposition to the regime. The first manifestation of this is of course the Tropicalia movement in 1968, many of whom are arrested, detained, exiled, and ultimately the Tropicalia movement is crushed by late 1969. Around this time, Milton's made this record in the States. He comes back to Belo Horizonte. He's hanging out there with his friends. They're all now gathering near the Borges family home. The Borges brothers have moved at the corner of these two streets, Rua Divinopolis and Rua Parisopolis, where the friends would gather and jam. And they called themselves the Corner Club or the Clube da Esquina. The collective had wide-ranging musical tastes from Brazilian styles to jazz to pop to psychedelia, and it continued to grow, and it started to get some fairly illustrious members, including future Grammy winner Aomir Deodato, who arranged so many great CTI releases in the early 1970s, and other future stars like Beto Guedes, Toninho, and Flavio Venturini. This group of musicians had seen what had happened to the Tropicalia folks, so they knew the immediate cost of resistance, but they also knew that they could not live under this oppression without somehow expressing themselves. So in 1971, what they did was rent themselves what was then a secluded house in a relatively secluded stretch of beach, which is now, of course, heavily populated, Paratininga. This beach is just north of Rio, and for three months they stayed there, they wrote, they rehearsed, they hung out, they played, and they got ready to make this record. This record itself was recorded at EMI Odeon Studios in Rio, and it's produced by a guy called Milton Miranda, Musicians include Milton Nascimento on vocals, piano and acoustic guitar, 
Lowe Borgeson, acoustic and electric guitar. He also sings, he sings lead on six of the songs. Beto Geddes, who plays bass, sings backing vocals, and also plays a variety of different kinds of guitar. Tevito plays three different kinds of guitar. Tonino plays guitar, bass, percussion, and vocals. Wagner Tiso takes care of organ and a lot of other keyboard duties. And of course, as I mentioned, Deodato does the arrangements. The context of the songs is always a dictatorship. Unlike Tropicalia, the lyrical content of this record is much more, I've heard it compared to magical realism. It's sung in riddles, and as a consequence, it was kind of difficult for the regime to find a way to stick a pin in it. There are 21 songs in this record, and I mean it when I say that there's something to really like about each one of them, but I haven't really got time to discuss them all, so I'll talk about half of them, which I think are the real highlights. The album opener is Tudo Que Vos Say, Podia Ser. This begins with Milton's really unearthly, haunting voice. He's back to first with a very simple acoustic arrangement. Tevito's 12-string guitar in particular is featured, as is the acoustic soloing by Lo Borges, and the whole feeling and the intent of the song and the lyrics it's essentially to lift the listener up and to give you strength at a time of dictatorship, bearing in mind that the listeners were largely originally young people with no prospect of really a better life because the dictatorship's main role was to kind of crush community, crush individuality, and to crush the spirit of people who might want something different. Otrem Azul, or The Blue Train, is Lo Borges' first contribution on the record. It's a big contribution. It's a chorus that probably most Brazilians can hum, or certainly of that generation can hum without much prompting. Dos Cruces is the Spanish song that I mentioned. It's one of the only covers in the record. It's sung by Milton. He's accompanying himself. It is impossibly beautiful as a song, probably the real highlight of this whole double disc. And it's almost gothic in its nature in that you have these two crosses that are on a hillside for two loves or two lovers who have died without really having understood each other. Um Girasel da Cor de Seu Cabello, which is a sunflower of the color of your hair, is another song sung by Lo Borges. I mentioned the Beatles influence earlier on, and this is truly a Beatles-esque song in terms of the melancholy melody and just the sheer beauty of the song construction. Clube de Esquina Number 2 is a song which, again, consistent with the theme of the record, is all about giving hope to younger people. And the lyrics are something like, dreams can't die despite the fact there's so much tear gas. This song has a really wonderful string arrangement by Deodato. I'm not a big fan of string arrangements in pop songs, typically, but I'll make an exception for this one. And the whole of Side 2 in particular is an incredibly strong album side. Os Povos, or The People, is another one of these solo songs with Milton accompanying himself. This is another song about the sense of alienation that the dictatorship was creating, about a village basically living on the edge of life, a village padlocked. Saida Se Benderas, number two, which is Exits and Flags, number two. There was an Exits and Flags, number one, earlier in the record. Gathering the strength to conquer the tide, man turning to stone, but the stone being more resilient than the tide and being able to conquer it, and so on. Again, thinly veiled allusions to resistance, but never actually explicitly saying that. Nada será como antes, or nothing will be like it was before, is about the uncertainty of relationships when people you know have been exiled or other kinds of relationships or families or friendships have been sundered by the regime and knowing that even after everything is repaired it will never be repaired people will never be quite the same. The album concludes with Ao que vai nascer or what will be born and here once again Milton is accompanying himself singing about a country damaged by oppression. He wanted to sing about a land with beaches and wines but the beach was dirty and the wine dried up. Depressing but at the end of the song there's this incredibly brilliant and vibrant little coda. That brings to an end an incredibly moving and incredibly beautiful record that I can't really do justice to in description. This is an album which in terms of scope and ambition but also execution and sheer quality and impact is right up there with the White Album, it's right up there with Exile on Main Street. What's truly amazing about this record is that it is very clearly protest music, particularly to anybody with the slightest poetic understanding. And yet it's also profoundly beautiful and graceful. It's not like the protest music of Tropicalia, which is much harsher. It's not like the protest music of punk. This is absolutely ethereal. If you're a jazz or a Western pop fan, you owe it to yourself to set aside your assumptions about what Brazilian music is, what it should sound like. And when you do that, it's easy, I think, to hear why this album is still so close to the hearts of so many. Easily, this album is five out of five. Do yourself a favor and listen to it today.